Hurricane Sam makes headlines. It's the first time that NOAA have successfully piloted a seagoing drone inside a hurricane. A first for climate science. The predictions that Vicky Minabi and Klaus Hasselman made all those years ago have become realised. We've seen that their predictions were correct. It's Friday the 8th of October and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. There's been quite a buzz about Hurricane Sam this week. The tropical storm has hit the headlines more than once. Here with the details is Alex Deacon. So Alex, tell me why Hurricane Sam has caused such a stir. Certainly an interesting one this, Claire. Hurricane Sam started life, like about 60% of hurricanes do, as an atmospheric disturbance off the east coast of Africa. It was declared a hurricane back on the 24th of September, so a couple of weeks ago now, and it topped out as a high-end Category 4 storm. Maximum winds, 155 miles an hour. So actually, this makes Sam the most powerful hurricane so far this season, and it spent eight consecutive consecutive days as a major hurricane before finally weakening. And there's more. Yes. Having started off off the East Africa coast, it then drifted across the Atlantic before heading northeastwards towards Newfoundland and then up towards Iceland, possibly making it the strongest hurricane ever to be observed so far east so late in the season. However, then it went through what's called extratropical transition, where it stops being a hurricane, it stops being fed by the warm seas, and just becomes a more typical, if slow-moving, nasty area of low pressure, like we see all the time across the UK, that's waxes and wanes depending on the jet stream. It did bring very wet and windy weather to Iceland. Did it make landfall as a hurricane? No, fortunately, it didn't actually hit land during its extraordinary track, uh, but parts of the US East Coast did have to deal with some pretty big surf and some rip current conditions from what was a distant Category 4 storm. It didn't make landfall, which is good news, but still, Hurricane Sam made headlines. Yeah, well, here's the really interesting thing as far as I'm concerned, anyway, about Hurricane Sam. It's the first time that NOAA have successfully piloted a seagoing drone inside a hurricane. I think this is just incredible, really. This type of drone isn't like the ones that you'd, you'd see online. They're called sail drones. They look like mini unmanned boats that are equipped with 25-foot sails to keep them moving. They also have what's called a hurricane wing to deal with powerful winds and to survive being crushed by large waves. So thanks to these sail drones, now scientists and as meteorologists can study what storms look like from the inside out. And this information will be really useful in refining future hurricane computer models. Thanks, Alex. Nobel Prizes are widely regarded as the most esteemed awards given for intellectual achievement. Since 1901, Nobel Prizes have been awarded every year for chemistry, medicine, literature, peace and physics. Until this year, the Physics Award has never officially recognised the work of climate scientists. That is, until now. Here's Professor Peter Stott. It's actually gone to two um, climate scientists that I know really well and that my colleagues know very well, Suki Minabi who's now based in the US, has been based there for many, many years, and Klaus Hasselmann, based in Germany. And it's really amazing news and surprising, actually, that climate science has been recognised in this way, but really wonderful news. What do they get their prize actually for? So Siki Minabi got his prize because he was effectively the first climate modeller, really, or the first person to develop the theoretical understanding and put it into a computer programme that provided the first ever realistic representation of our climate and how it's going to change. And if you look at the original work of Suki Minabi, which is now going way back into the 1960s, and look at those groundbreaking work, he and his collaborators, but particularly led by Suki Minabi, captured many of the features of climate change that we're seeing today. And then the other scientist was somebody called Klaus Hasselmann, and I know Klaus Hasselmann pretty well. I've met him several times because he founded the whole science that I've spent my career working on, which is the detection and attribution of climate change. And it was Klaus Hasselmann 
who began that whole line of research. Why has there been no Nobel Prize for climate science up to this point? Why now? Because the, the predictions that um, Siki Minabi and Klaus Hasselman made all those years ago have become realised. We've seen that their predictions were correct. And if you think about other discoveries in physics, like the theoretical discovery that Peter Higgs and colleagues made about the Higgs boson, it took all the time before the Higgs boson was actually seen at the CERN accelerator before Higgs and his collaborators got the Nobel Prize. And I think there's a similar analogy there. So now the scientists have won this amazing award. What's the value to them? What's the value to the discipline of climate science? Its value, I think, is that it's such a prestigious award that it recognises climate science, which is right and proper as a really um, fundamental discipline alongside many of the other traditional academic disciplines. And also at a time when we've got the big climate negotiations coming up in Glasgow very soon. So it's very timely in that respect to really say to the world at large that the predictions and the theoretical understanding that was made decades ago now has been borne out by reality, but there is still time, as long as urgent action and decisions are made in Glasgow, to solve climate change and to get the world onto a better trajectory. Professor Peter Stott. A new European record for heavy rain was set earlier this week in northern Italy. More than 740 millimetres of rain fell in just 12 hours on Monday. Red alerts, the highest level of weather warning, were issued across many regions the violent storms caused bridges to collapse and many people had to be rescued. Worst hit was Genoa, where extreme rainfall caused floods and landslides. This backbuilding type of storm, fuelled by the warm waters of the Gulf of Genoa, was incredibly slow moving, allowing torrential downpours to remain across the northwest of Italy for hours on end. Although it tends to be this time of year when southern Europe sees these stormy conditions, rainfall this week has been unparalleled. Storm warnings are now in force from Croatia to northern Greece. Now with the weather outlook for the next few days here in the UK, Aidan McGiven. Thursday night wasn't quite the warmest October night on record in Northern Ireland and Scotland, but there wasn't much in it. And the subtropical warmth that has been wafted across the UK courtesy of ex-Hurricane Sam continues to stay with us through the weekend. It will not only bring us warm weather, but it's also bringing us an awful lot of wet weather. And Northern Ireland, as well as Western Scotland, will turn wetter once again during Friday night. That rain's still around on Saturday morning, along with a lot of cloud cover across the UK. But clear skies towards the southeast overnight will mean it's a fresh start here with a few mist and fog patches first thing. They'll lift through the morning to sunny skies for East Anglia, parts of the East Midlands, Central Southern and Southeast England. Otherwise, a lot of cloud for much of the UK, the rain easing in the northwest, and for Northern Ireland and northwest Scotland, it turns brighter through the day as well as drier. In between, a lot of cloud cover for much of uh, central, southern Scotland, northern England, and Wales, with some outbreaks of light rain and drizzle, mainly over hills and coasts. But this will tend to ease through the day, and it will be another mild day across the UK on Saturday, with temperatures way up in the high teens in many spots. By Sunday, the area of cloud and outbreaks of generally light rain and drizzle drifts southeastwards and slowly clears the southeast of England as a very much weakening feature. To the north of that, much brighter skies for many, a decent day of sunny spells, feeling a little bit cooler, but temperatures still above average for the time of year, and some blustery showers will blow in across the north of Scotland. Into the start of next week, high pressure builds quite firmly across the UK, but it will also bring areas of cloud in from the Atlantic. So it won't be entirely sunny and temperatures will begin to trend downwards back to around average for the time of year. Thanks, Aidan. Just before we go, here's Martin Bowles with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes observed between Monday the 27th of September and Sunday the 3rd of October. The highest temperature of the week was 19.4 Celsius at RAF Coningsby in Lincolnshire on Tuesday. Early morning air frosts returned to Scotland last week. The lowest recorded temperature was minus 1.4 Celsius at Aboyne in Aberdeenshire on Thursday. Rainfall was plentiful last week and the highest daily recorded value was 45.6 millimetres at Capelcurig in Gwynedd, North Wales on Thursday. The largest sunshine hour total was recorded in Devon on Sunday. 
10.8 hours was measured at North Wyke, a few miles north of Dartmoor. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.